there's an ongoing trend I've noticed in the gaming landscape since the beginning of this year. It's likely you've felt it as well. Beyond the tech industry's brutal nature being laid bare for everyone to see, with the literal decimation of dozens of fan-favorite development houses happening left and right, many high-budget AAA or even <coughs> quadruple-A titles are being released to lackluster critical review and even worse audience reception as well. In the meantime, surprise hits are springing up from the ground like a horde of alien bugs and sweeping over the masses, some finding huge followings in mere days. So, how do we end up in this situation? Because it seems like there's a huge discrepancy between the internally expected outcome of any given release as compared to the reality of some recently undeniable sales numbers. The primary audience for these shiny new games trends increasingly wary of what's on offer. In the first quarter of 2024 alone, we've already seen two high-profile flops and a multitude of unforeseen successes. Let's dive into why I think that is, and what it means for the near future of gaming. These days, when you take into account the pushback and postponing of many large releases, as well as the predatory monetization schemes which have plagued the industry, we're kind of left in this space where the bigger studios often appear to have lost their way, whereas the nimble and trim indie developers are there to pick up the pieces. Now, these smaller productions are thriving off of the starved audiences they find awaiting them. Perhaps the most egregious negative example thus far this year is Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League by Rocksteady Studios, a game which everyone should be thoroughly tired of crapping all over by now. That's not my intention here. It's cool to like what you like. In fact, I had a friend mention that they had been enjoying this title, and instead of breaking out my holy symbol of choice and banishing them from my presence like some sort of literal video game fanatic, we chatted over what they thought of the campaign and their choice of build, and what they appreciated about it all. You know, like, reasonable people. But I digress, because there is a point to be made. Suicide Squad was a big, flashy release that had undergone multiple reiterations over the course of years' worth of development time. A monumental amount of work hours, effort, talent, and money went into the production of this game. The general reception to the preview showcases prior to this game's release indicated the presence of an obviously displeased fanbase. The potentially interested parties weren't partial to the whole looter-shooter packaging that Suicide Squad had been wrapped up in, and they were quite vocal with their displeasure concerning the current outlook of things. However, much like a huge ship at sea, or an unreliable car with a hefty steel body and a pair of flat tires, there was apparently no turning this one around. Dumpster fire or not, this thing was coming out one way or another. Ultimately, upon release, and to the surprise of very few, Suicide Squad became a textbook example of an unrequited failure so far as sales were concerned. IGN reported that, by Warner Brothers' own admission, the game fell short of expectations. And when you've spent years pursuing that ongoing live service title which you clearly anticipated to be a major hit, I'm sure that kind of statement really inspires confidence in your commitment to the future of this game. Let's take a look at the numbers. At this moment, Suicide Squad trends less than 500 players on Steam during its daily peak. That's pretty dismal. There are a multitude of reasons for this game's vastly negative reception. You're probably already acutely aware of all that. So instead, let's pivot and make a comparison toward another recent release, this time in the supposedly double-A scene, Helldivers 2 by Arrowhead Studios. Much like Suicide Squad, Helldivers 2 required many years of development time. Also, much like Suicide Squad, Helldivers 2 has live service aspirations. They are both titles which are seeking out a player base to hook into their ever-evolving array of features and mechanics on offer. They're both current-gen, third-person shooters, distinct enough in gameplay, but similar enough in genre and audience that the comparison is apt, in my opinion. Arrowhead, the Helldivers dev, currently only have about 100 employees. Rocksteady, on the other hand, has about 250. This isn't meant to come across as a dig at anyone, rather, it's meant to put in perspective the difference in scope between a double-A and a triple-A studio. In spite of this, the difference in their title's initial reception could not be any more different. When put up against Suicide Squad, the Helldivers 2 had very little preamble. 
Some preview videos and a spotlight in a Sony presentation isn't nothing by any means, but the indication was that this was a notably smaller effort with humbler thoughts on success. Really, there was very little chatter about Helldivers 2 leading up to release, good or bad. The subreddit, which now numbers over 400,000 members, boasted only a meager 17,000 around the time of release, most of whom were fans of the original title. Well, to the surprise of everyone, including the devs themselves based on their only recently resolved server troubles, Helldivers 2 proved to be a total smash success. This was, apparently, vastly the work of word of mouth as well. Because you have to consider that major reviewers weren't provided much of a preview period, with most releasing their thoughts well after the game had already come out. Now, Helldivers 2 regularly reaches player count peaks in the hundreds of thousands, with a reception which blows the comparatively behemoth efforts of Suicide Squad straight out of the water. This is far from the first time that a AAA title has floundered while a smaller release finds itself the king of the hill for a moment, but doesn't it feel like this is happening more and more often? Even more recently, Skull and Bones from the gaming titan Ubisoft looks to suffer from the exact same issues. And in the recent past, we've had Pal World and before that Hi-Fi Rush, which are both beloved by their players and better received by critics alike. During my admittedly light investigation, one common factor began to stand out to me when comparing all these titles. I'm not going to claim that this all boils down to a single issue by any means, but I couldn't ignore the fact that there appears to be two distinct sides here. On one, you have the privately owned passion projects, and on the other, you have the big boys beholden to good old shareholder interest. It proves true time and time again that the suits at the wheel of these productions prioritize appeasing those shareholders over all else, quality or fun be damned. The pursuit of endless growth paired with a bigger is better mindset have left them blinded to the interests of the people who actually play their game. Now, the trophy of some undefinable and nebulous quadruple A title dangles before their eyes. Yet it remains so self-defeating that the very titles which prove ravenously hungry for your credit card numbers are flopping because that's all they seem to care about. You know what's more important than diverse gameplay and a reasonable amount of content? A cash shop, a $70 price tag, and the promise that the player's investment in these games will never end. Ever, never, ever, ever. That's what they've heard makes the big bucks as of late, and they are chasing those ambitions with the same fervor I muster when I'm chasing down that portal as the whole zone collapses at my back. We'll readily hand you those credit card numbers, trust me. You just gotta make a game worth playing first. What a conundrum. That's not to say there isn't talent and passion behind the flops, nor that there isn't immense risk and external pressure on the indie studios. But no matter how talented and well-meaning the devs are, it's clear that they are often being completely screwed by unrealistic expectations, wrongfully diverted efforts, and unreasonable release dates which come along with being publicly traded. I don't imagine for one second that they think, you know what, these guys, they're, they're really helping us to make a better game, rather than... Fuck. If we place a lens on the really big winners as of late, we had Baldur's Gate 3 storm onto the scene, then came Pal World, and now Helldivers 2, developed by Larian Studios, Pocket Pair, and Arrowhead, respectively. Each of these games has been released to critical acclaim and skyrocketing sales. And you know what all these dev companies have in common? They're all privately owned. Not one of them is publicly traded. Their games are superior, at least in part, because they don't have that external stranglehold telling them what to do. They can just prioritize making the best game possible, and the results are clear. You can see it in these games' professional reviews and the player's reception and their sales. Of course, this rule doesn't always prove true. There are many larger dev companies who have seemingly managed to overcome these problems. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth appears massive in scope, and has already been reviewed quite well. Elden Ring's DLC, Shadow of the Erd Tree, has finally been announced, and I would place my bets on that proving a quality production. Sometimes that passion comes through in the large-scale stuff, and it's not as though the AAA space is without a share of hits, last year was absolutely full of them. But you get the sense that these teams were offered the freedom to pursue their greatest works, entrusted by their investors to reach players through the merit of a fun, quality release. Sadly, it appears the same can't be said of other contemporary titles as of late. And now, on to my final point. 
Perhaps it's partly our expectations which have grown slightly out of whack. Remember when I said Arrowhead was a mere 100 employees? I mean, that was a pretty big studio a decade ago. And the value that these smaller productions offer to their players is anything but AA in my opinion. I've gotten more hours out of Ironwood Studios' Pacific Drive, which is a lot of the gameplay you've been watching partly just because I really like it, than I have out of all sorts of hugely anticipated titles. The variance of what we can expect at any given price point is all over the place these days. Yet reliably, the $70 titles prove questionable, whereas the quote-unquote lesser games are truly excellent. What was once big is now small, and what was once huge is now bloated beyond all recognition. I think the industry is undergoing quite the shift, and in the end we'll be left with new classifications to observe as these smaller studios produce sizable titles. Even the meager indie games of today often blow the works of 20 years ago away with their expansiveness and depth of gameplay. Technology and passion combined are blurring the lines found within the old scale of things, and we're bound to feel the reverberations of today's successes and failures for years to come. I hope you've appreciated my thoughts, or perhaps you have some of your own. If so, share them in the comments. And since you've made it this far, why not throw us a like while you're at it? If you really enjoyed our stuff, hit the bell and subscribe for more Freakopolis content, and, as always, thank you for watching.